Hi all! Today is a video about two different fragrances as I do my fragrance autopsy videos and in my fragrance autopsy series I'm really characterizing, dissecting and really getting to the nitty-gritty of the scents that you may or may not be interested in. I generally do include my personal opinion about it because well it's my channel uh, but uh, certainly I will try to give you the best possible idea because your taste might be different from mine but what I describe might appeal to you. So today we have a twofer because I don't have a lot to say about either fragrance it's going to be a two-in-one video where we're going to be discussing Chloe Nomad as well as Daisy Dream. Both of them are certainly in a similar vein so it is a bit of a compare and contrast and I do I do have a preference there. We're going to start with the one that was released first which is Daisy Dream. Daisy Dream was released in 2014 following a all-time favorite ever so popular original fragrance Daisy with a very very obnoxious bottle. That bottle haunted me in my dreams. The tackiness of it is so campy that I think that's what they were going for and I guess if that's what they were going for it had worked. Definitely not my taste. Daisy Dream by the way does have a very very nice bottle and uh, displayable and I wouldn't be annoyed to look at it so Daisy Dream thing. Daisy Dream is supposed to be more sophisticated, uplifted, more ethereal, more lightweight and feminine version of Daisy. I don't know how far feminine you want to go because Daisy is a fruity floral with the emphasis on the floral um, which is slightly boring but very very pleasant. Not my personal cup of tea but I do understand why it's so popular. It's hard to dislike. It's just you know it's like that boring friend in school who you really don't want to hang out with because she's so vanilla and kind of just makes you yawn but you can always rely on her. Your mom likes her. You know that girl. Most of what's going on in Daisy Dream is fruity floral with the emphasis on the fruity side unlike the Daisy. This particular fragrance was a love child of Anne Gottlieb who is a very well-rounded and famous perfumer along with Marc Jacobs himself who is the second author of this particular fragrance. I'm always curious to look into the Daisy line because honestly its likable but boring nature makes me feel like at some point sometime somebody is going to make a flanker that I will be liking and I have to say I'm not so sure that Daisy Dream is it for me but it is certainly a more elevated more elegant version of the original girly young slightly mature Daisy. It's not a toilet formulation so the longevity the sillage none of that is really impressive but it's on par with all other designer auto toilet formulations so it, you know it's not embarrassingly poorly constructed to the point where it falls apart on your skin immediately and evaporates and you say goodbye to it but uh, it's not one of the fragrances that is going to really stick to your skin create any kind of uh, aura around you and sometimes that's just better because some people really want others to know what kind of fragrance they're wearing they want for the fragrance to scream off their skin uh, but generally that just kind of annoys people. So a more demure, more gentle formulation is not always a bad idea. Perhaps reapplication can be one of those things that you do at your lunch break. The bottle really embodies what they were trying to create here. It's this blue hue with the lacy overlay of white flowers. It has nothing to do with daisies but it is a fruity floral so they kind of slotted it into this particular collection. I think it's not that it doesn't belong but if you're a fan of Daisy specifically it's not a sister or distant cousin it's just like a girl who lives on the other side of the town but not dissimilar in terms of its spirit and what it's trying to say. A really nice touch that I've learned to appreciate is this slightly creamier coconutty fresh coconut note in the very base. It does smooth out the very banal fruity floralness of it so I think that was a really nice move. It was a way to really collect the scent into the scent bouquet. What you're going to smell upon application is going to be a ton of wisteria so 
slightly purple fresh floral which is a really nice way to open and purple florals are always extremely elegant drawn back and they create this ethereal watercolor see-through impressionistic uh, picture which I think is rather delicate and beautiful. Now after the hit of purple florals what comes is what people like. Give the crowd what it likes and what people like is the berries, the sweets and the fruit which is a plenty here and really what the fragrance is focusing on is a blackberry note. I specifically me personally I have a very a tender relationship with the um, blackberry scents. Blackberry uh, perfumes sit very, very nicely on my skin and don't tend to go into the disgustingly jammy territory. So for me, that was a very, very good choice to try and balance the elegance of the purple florals. And they're trying to balance that with like a juiciness, yumminess of a berry. That worked. It did work in this particular instance. At the base, as I said, there is a touch of coconut which really gives it a little something something with a very generic white wood and uh, white musk. Very, very clean. I could imagine a laundry detergent, a nice expensive laundry detergent, smelling of something approximating this particular scent. I wasn't mad at the scent. I think it is the best so far I've smelt in the Daisy line. Not for me, I will not be buying it. It is a little too faceless, I dare say, um, for what I like in a fruity floral, because for me, it's such an oversaturated segment of the fragrance market. I really need something super special to excite me and get me to purchase. Fruity florals are very, very well represented and it's hard to surprise people. If this was released in maybe 2000s, that then I would have been extremely impressed and then I would have been all over it. But because right now we just have such a selection of very, very similar scents, this one kind of withers a little bit into the background. It's not as exciting. It's not as interesting because there is no innovation. Unfortunately, absolutely none. Uh, and creativity really wasn't there either whenever they were coming up with that scent, which is unfortunate, but it is extremely, extremely commercial. Mark Jacobs, well, that's what he does. He does extremely commercial things that will sell well. He's very into making money and that is and that is what he does very well. That is what he does with his fragrances and that is what he does with this particular fragrance as well. Um, like I said, it doesn't really totally belong in the Daisy lineup, but they slotted it in for sales reasons, you know, for marketing reasons, not with any other thought in mind. Um, no daisies here. You won't find them. But as I said, for a simple, delicate, lacy, see-through and slightly foggy purple floral with lots and lots of fruit, um, I think it's not bad. I think that is one of those fragrances that would make a really good gift for people because as I said, it's really difficult to dislike, as is the original Daisy. So that goes for both of them. Both fragrances I think would be really hard to have a negative reaction towards. Um, the worst that can happen is probably people are going to think they're boring scents. They smell nice, but nothing exciting. And this is what I feel about them. But I do recognize the commercial pool and the interest uh, in advancing the scent story of the girl that the original Daisy was for when she was in high school. So a high school, early college kind of uh, lady that's what the daisy was designed to satisfy and then we're thinking like maybe she's in her first career maybe she hasn't been fired yet and maybe she's uh, starting to feel like she's adulting here you go now she has this still very childish bottle slightly more elevated with a slightly more elevated scent but basically the same um but basically within the same realm of understanding it's the same woman who wears both one a little bit younger, one a little bit older. It's okay. So it's okay. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend it as a gift if you want a perfume signature, if you want something exciting, interesting, if you want something that is a work of art, that is a hallmark of a professional fragrance house. That ain't it, girl. That ain't it, girl. You won't find it here. It's just, it's, it's, that's not what it's designed to do. It's like wanting Zara to produce to Mugler pieces. Zara is good at what they do. They do mass market. 
I would say the same about this particular line in Marc Jacobs um, lineup. It's mass market. It's very mass market. And that's it. That's all there is to it. I can't really describe a person who would wear it because it's any person who's uh, it's any person whose cousin didn't know what to buy for her and therefore they bought the daisy. All right, enough about spilled milk. Let's move on with Chloe. Uh, if I have a lot of nice things to say about Daisy, um, if I, if I do have a lot of nice things to say about Daisy Dream, this cannot go, ex unfortunately, my review of Chloe is not going to go the same way. I'm not going to be like, yeah, girl, buy it. It's fine. You're probably going to satisfy your whatever third cousin's dreams by buying this for her. But Nomad, let's discuss. So Nomad was supposed to be another pillar in their lineup. They have the Chloe, uh, which is the original which is the lineup where they have a ton of different flankers. Um, they have, they did have Love Chloe. Unfortunately, they discontinued. That was the only interesting and high quality fragrance so far that I've seen from Chloe's uh, mass market line or designer line, let's just say. And Nomad is supposed to be the next step up, the next lineup, the next vibe, the next thing for Chloe. Personally, again, I'm not a huge fan of this particular fragrance house because I've never been drawn to these, because I've never been drawn to the boho chic aesthetic that they're pro propagating. This is their aesthetic and it's never really been my thing. And I'm not really sure if the fragrances they were producing always vibe with the kind of aesthetic they go for within their clothing line. I'm not a fashionista, so I am going to reserve my opinion about it, but what they're trying to do with it is create a floral sheeper. Unfortunately, what we got out of it was really not sheeper. I'm very confused why they would classify this fragrance as such. I understand that in theory, sheeper is, so it has specific mossy notes, etc., which technically this one does, but most of what you get in this particular fragrance is a fruit, is a is a lot of fruit. There is maybe a sheeper undertone, but this is not a sheeper fragrance per se for me because it doesn't really follow the whole vibe of what you would think to be classic sheeper fragrances. I did like the design of the bottle. I think the presentation was on point. I think their marketing campaign was great. Fleur Fortune did a very, very good job with the ad campaign. It was tastefully curated, for sure it was. They were definitely, definitely going for a modernized idea of a cheaper fragrance, which I actually can appreciate because these guys aren't being made nowadays very frequently. Um, you go to your Chanel cheapers, you go to your classics, yet you can't find um, recently released uh, cheaper fragrances very easily, at least in the sort of designer in a luxury perfume sort of segment uh, yes of course of course independent houses are still releasing wonderful sheepers i am aware but if you want to get your fragrance from sephora you really ain't gonna find anything new and exciting in, in this particular genre first and foremost what you get is a lot of uh, very lightweight and green plum. So this is not the luscious, beautiful, juicy plum you bite into and it just sort of um, flows down your shirt and it's you're just you just you're just eating it. You're in it. It's delicious. Not one of those. Um, this is a greenish plum which you buy in a plastic box to take with you on a car road trip and you sort of while driving with one hand, you're reaching over for a plum and sort of biting it and it's a little sour. It was probably collected when it was underripe. So that's the plum we're talking about. It is a green, fresh, non-juicy, non-sweet uh, type of a fruit. And then you have lots of moss there. I will give the creators that. I will give Quentin Vich the benefit of the doubt on that one. There is definitely there is definitely the idea of mossiness that is there. It's not very literal. I'm sure they were going for a very modern feel. So mossiness is neutered. <laughs> it's not It's not a real forest mossiness with slight dirt to it, which is really what you're thinking about if you're thinking about sheepers most of the time. Um, so there's not a grit to it. It's very much Eliza Doolittle after the transformation. Oh yes, sir, of course, sir. 
So very uptight proper, which isn't quite what I expected from Chloe House. Again, they kind of, to me, go for the boho vibe, which I did not really pick up on here specifically. Here's what I do really like in this formulation, is the combination of this very clean um, theoretical moss that is definitely present in there with amber wood. The amber wood is the key here. That is what gives this fragrance personality at all. If the amber wood was foregone, there would be nothing to it and I wouldn't be talking about it honestly. I'll probably just bypass it and not want to spend any time reviewing it. But this combination of oak moss and amber wood with a touch of peach, that's really what we're talking about here. There is a very little that is floral there. There's a slightly screechy freesia, which I could take it or leave it really. Um, I think the heart of the fragrance is the mossy amber wood that is giving it just that little bit of, that is giving it just that little bit of kick that makes me feel that Chloe is not a total waste of time and taste. There is a woody musk base to it. It holds on to skin actually quite decently, which I was pleased with because even though you don't oftentimes want a huge sillage you do want good longevity and that is a hard balance to uh, tackle and it's it's worked out very well here so i would say who would wear nomad i think in your mind with the name of the fragrance you're really imagining uh, a very free-spirited uh loose-haired um, barefoot sort of adventurous uh, I would say probably not. It's a college-aged woman and she is, she studies something like English literature of the 16th century. She likes sort them floral dresses with cowboy boots perhaps, but I'm not talking southern here, I'm talking the hat-wearing girl. You know, the girl with a big brimmed hat, maybe wearing some fringe who potentially, perhaps she likes to fake her way through life a little bit, maybe she's a bit uptight, she wants to appear a little bit more relaxed. She wants to appear a little more, bit more interesting and approachable. That's what Nomad tries to do. It's someone quite uptight, trying to look like they're someone quite relaxed. Um, there is a little bit of a tension there. It's not necessarily bad. It really can be quite interesting. And the overall impression is really rather pleasant. Not something I personally, again, would wear myself over a long period of time, but I did enjoy my decants and I really did build up uh, some understanding of what this fragrance is all about. Um, this probably will appeal to quite a lot of people. If you're a noob to mossy woody fragrances and you just, you just want a gentle soapy introduction to it, Nomad might be your girl. Nomad might let you get used to those notes without um, feel without feeling a little put off by them because they are just so well integrated, so soapy and so clean. Um, as I said before, neutered. That I think anybody would be able to really digest the scent and not mind it. Uh, the agar wood with the moss is an interesting combination and I think that's the saving grace of this particular fragrance and if there is anything to look forward there to, it's that combo. And luckily that is something that stays on your skin for a while, it is not one of those uh, magical disappearing acts that some fragrances sometimes pull on us with interesting and cool note combinations. So if I could describe this fragrance in three words or less, I'll probably require three words. It's going to be super clean, proper, I get nothing, two words was enough. So if we're just drawing a line under this particular review, Daisy Dream and Omad are really for the girls from the same dorm. Um, both of them are floral Nomad, imagines herself maybe liking modern art a little bit more, maybe a little bit more pretentious with a little twist to it. Daisy Dream is a general, quite generic purple floral. It's very pleasant and it's smothered in fruit which is, again, quite pleasant and enjoyable. Uh, either of those, I would say probably I don't, either of those, of course, anybody can wear, but um, I do feel like those are quite young fragrances. Let me know what you think of them, whether you own them or owned them in the past and whether you had a different experience with these guys. That's it for today. See you guys later. Have a wonderful day and good luck. Bye-bye.